What's going on, everybody? We're back. It's the Sooners Illustrated Podcast, episode 16 on this Thursday, September 7th, 2023. Yeah, that's a tough one. Josh Calloway, Colin <laughs> Kennedy, James Jackson, Tom Green will be along a little later on in the show. CK, how's it going, my guy? Uh, week one in the books for college football. You watch the game from afar. It feels good. Lots of games under our belt. It's nice. Good thing. Good times. Man. My man, there's there was football that happened. I mean, that, that feels that feels good to say. I mean, we actually were able to take in some real life football rather than discussing basically the mm-hmm. reality TV side of the sport, as I always say. So, <laughs> no, nah, that was awesome. I mean, it was a really cool moment to finally get the season kicked off. We had some really good games across the board too. Um, obviously, the the headliner LSU Florida State didn't end the way I wanted it to, but overall. Good to see OU kick off the season. Good to see everybody back on the field. And good to see fans in the stands, man. Like, that was that was awesome to see. And, and I'm glad that everyone had fun at all these events. 100%. 100%. It was a great start, uh, obviously, <laughs> for Oklahoma. We talked about that on Monday's show. Uh, Tom James and I did the full kind of reaction recap of, of the game. If you missed that, obviously, it's not going anywhere. It's still on YouTube, anywhere you get your podcast. Oklahoma won 73 nothing. Colin, you were uh, a big help, obviously, contributing. You weren't on site with the three of us, but lots of game day reactions from yourself as well. Um, you know, I, like I said, we already did the full recap of the game. Yeah. But I know you, you know, you saw the game from afar. I got to imagine you probably, like the rest of us, were just like, holy moly, this is a complete demolition. We all had a big blowout. I mean, you had a big blowout score. I did as well, obviously, but 73 nothing is a little different. I, yeah, I remember at the end of it, I was like, our board members were convincing me to increase my score every day. <laughs> I, I ended up going, I think, 52-14, and I was even then like, man, that might be a little too much. And lo and behold, 73 nothing goes up on the board. That was a beatdown. You guys did a great job of talking about that, so I won't dive into it. But I did want to lead off the show with a kind of a, a discussion going on that note. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously, since we started the site, you noted this on the board the other day, Josh, like, Oklahoma fans have been great to us. It has been awesome since we've started this site up. And they've been great to us even before we started the site. And it's just been really cool to get around our board members and meet some of these people in person. And I've always believed that the Oklahoma fan base is a little bit different. You know, they rally around their own. And I I felt like one of my primary takeaways going off of that game, too, was I, I really felt like everyone who – helped out with the, the pink out initiative and supported yeah. whether they're on site or from afar. Like I, it just was another reminder. I believe that, that this fan base is incredible whenever they put their mind to something and, and look like breast cancer, cancer in general, it's a terrible disease that we all at some point in our lives, I think interact with and, and have to, to interact with in a, in a negative way. But I just, I like the fact that Oklahoma took an opportunity and capitalize on it and supported not just Brent Venables and, and his wife, mm. but also the countless of other people out there who are fighting it, you know, not to dive into it as well. But for me personally, I've got someone close to me fighting the disease as well. So I wanted to give Oklahoma fans a shout out to start up the show. And that was a really cool initiative. I don't know who started it, but I feel like I would have been remiss if not we hadn't recognized what they did with that Arkansas State game. It's one thing to see a 73-0 beat down. You're like, man, this is <laughs> – it was pretty nuts to watch, but it was crazy to see OU fans rally around Brent Venables and his family, and I thought it also helped a lot of people out there as well. So that shouldn't go unnoticed. Oh, 100%. Uh, I'm glad you brought it up. You know, it Brent Venables put it perfectly in a post game, and he's asked about it where he said, you know, very touched, but not surprised. I'm uh, not surprised. Mm-hmm. That, that's that's Oklahoma. Oklahoma, uh, they take care of their own, and obviously uh, a born and raised in the state. So I – not surprised either the fans wanted to do that and you know there was a lot it got you know it was hard to especially when it started to clear out a little bit you started to be able to really look at individual fans rather than just a glob of people when there's ninety thousand in there you really have to kind of start to see like there's a lot of people wearing pink and we're walking around the concourse and outside the stadium that was really cool and uh, you could tell it meant a lot to to brent Uh, obviously as his wife julie battles that so and then, like mm-hmm. you said, almost everybody's got somebody in their family. I do, um, you know, that has had to fight that. And so very cool. And, uh, you know, that's a good call by you. Bring that up. Yeah. It, good, was, good it, was, it was awesome. And, and look, our best wishes continue to go out to Julie, right? Hope, hope yeah. everything's going well and, and that a continuous fight is going in their direction. But with that said, Josh, 
I got a mason jar, no coffee today, water, got to hydrate because I'm sure it was toasty. So let's get into some football. It was toasty, and it's going to be toasty again. Looking forward to it uh, on Saturday, and we'll get there. Oklahoma SMU, we're going to have a full game preview, obviously. We'll get Colin Stotts and Tom and James a little bit later. But to kind of type some loose ends on this past weekend on the recruiting side, we talked about it last week, CK, lots of guys. And I can say from firsthand experience, I was down on the field. Almost anybody you could think of was there, basically. I It was just a who's who of both guys who are committed and as well as OU targets. I mean, as far as guys who are committed, Obviously, you knew Sperry would be there. Taylor Tatum was there. Xavier Robinson was there. I mean, just everybody felt like in the class in 24 and 25 was there, plus a lot of guys that they're targeting. Big one that OU fans are certainly locked in on, in-state guy Danny Okoye up there in Tulsa, Noah. He was in town, Colin. You you want to – what are you hearing here? Uh, Oklahoma fans, it's kind of been one that I think OU fans have tried to decide how excited should they get, how high should they let their hopes get. Where do you feel like the Sooners are kind of standing right now with uh, with the Koye? Man, I think high hopes are justified, to be honest with you. I mean, the the early intel that flew out of that visit was quite positive, to say the least. Mm. I think. You know, and I noted this on the board. I think we give a lot of love, and rightfully so, to guys like Kevin Sperry, Michael Hawkins, some of these other recruits that Oklahoma has committed, even a Taylor Tatum, for example, those guys get a lot of love for not only who they are, but what they do from a recruiting standpoint. Yeah. Like they're out pursuing these guys just as much as the Oklahoma staff. And I think someone that I mentioned on the board who flies under the radar a little bit, man, Jamie Nickens is a big, like beloved personality across the recruiting scene. I mean, I, I talked to Zion Kearney, what, not a week or two ago out of his game in Hightower, and he mentioned, like, yeah, Jay Nickens is one of my favorite guys to talk to. We've been getting to know each other, and he, he just gets along with everyone really well. And I was told by a source that Jay Nickens was the guy who kind of took it upon himself during the weekend to recruit Danny Okoye. And hmm. from some shadow boxing to pranking him and messing with him to just – Talking to Danny throughout the weekend, it seems like Jaden really helped OU there, as well as obviously what guys like McGill Chavis have been able to accomplish. Coach Chavis is, I mean, honestly, he's turned this thing from an impossibility to yeah. a very real partnership. And I think out of the weekend, that is definitely how I would describe it. I think OU leads here. I think they lead by maybe a lot. Now, one thing I am keeping an eye on is what happens next because the visit list in season was lengthy, right? I mean, he had LSU, Texas, Tennessee, was working on Alabama, a couple others thrown in the mix. I mean, he, he had a chance to see a lot of big-time SEC game, that game day environments, and I don't know what the next steps are there. I think Oklahoma is in ongoing discussions with Danny as far as how does he want to, to work things out. But he is set to drop a top three list sometime soon. Could be as early as when we're recording this thing. Mm -hmm. I expect Oklahoma to be in there. And from that point forward, I mean, I, I think whoever the other two schools are, this is OU's battle to lose right now. And that's that's incredibly encouraging to say, considering where this recruitment was not even a few months ago. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know far better than me, but it, it did. It felt like that it was always kind of like a, a long shot. I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but it felt like that, that Oakland was never really the leader there. Now I'm kind of following you and obviously Steve Wolfong and all other great insiders, and it's like, okay, this this actually might be happening. And, uh, you know, if you're unfamiliar with the Koye, obviously he goes to a, a really small – I mean, it's a homeschool football team, Tulsa Noah up there, so not a lot of people really see him play. Composite metric, he's the number one player in Oklahoma in 2024, edge rusher. So this is a guy you want. Uh, it goes without saying. So we'll keep yeah. up with uh, on I'll, I'll tell you this too, Josh. Like This is the kind of kid that's not just like, oh, he's got a good ranking. But, I mean, we – you know, I have to send some feedback whenever I can to our guys who lead the rankings discussions. And I've had a couple of them call me and be like, all right, what do you think we need to do about Okoye? And the other day I told him, well – you know, he's like what, six foot four, six foot five, 246 pounds, can put 600 pounds on the straight bar, and he can hurdle his own teammates in practice in real time. <laughs> so I was like, we probably are going to look bad if we don't bring him up. 
Now, I fully expect this guy to rise in the rankings. I think there's a real possibility he becomes our number one ranked player in the state of Oklahoma very soon. It's just a little bit more game tape, right? You mean you mentioned he plays for the home school out there in Tulsa. But, yeah, man, I, I one thing I'm hoping to push for is to get our guy Josh out there to get some highlights of Danny Akoy. Because if we can get a hurdle on the defensive side of the ball, yeah. I mean, that's going viral. So that's, that's just the kind of player Danny Okoye is, man. There's reason you want this guy. Yeah, the only guys we have uh, above him right now are what Edwards out there in Wagner and then Zadavian Sims, obviously, is an Oregon commit. Those are the guys in front of him right now. Um, but we'll see that that could change in due time. He's a really talented player. So I like to see him play in person. Uh, that, that's for sure at some point this year. Um, elsewhere over the weekend, I think OU fans got to become a little more acquainted. With uh, we talked about him last week. This is my first go at saying his name, Daniel Akunkunmi. Took a shot. Bang. It was all right. Bang. It was all right. Um, <laughs> over abroad, uh, you know, abroad here. He's from London, England, at the NFL Academy out there. He documented basically every step of his trip uh, on Twitter, which was kind of fun to see. He's like, I'm in Atlanta now. Now I'm in Oklahoma. I can't imagine the like the I don't know. Culture shock's the right word, but Oklahoma and England are different places. <laughs> a very different. That place. is true. Also, the temperature, <laughs> I'm sure, caught him by surprise a little bit. Um, but he was in town over the weekend. This is a guy who felt like Oklahoma's been in good shape for. How do you feel like um, things stand right now, and what are you hearing about how his visit went? Um, I don't know if it's his first time in America, um, if he'd been before, um, but I got to imagine, again, a visit was maybe more important for him than any than even the normal recruit. He's got to come see it before he would want to do anything. So I'm curious how that went for him. Yeah, it went really well. So some some backstory here. He's he's gone to a couple places. I know his first official visit was over the summer to Baylor, of all places. Uh, his first experience, essentially, with an official visit setting down there in Waco, and I think that set the bar high for him. But this was his first true college football game in person. Right. So – I think for Daniel going into this, I mean, we know OU is is what it is, right? The Palace on the Prairie got 83, 86,000 strong, officially listed. I mean, it, there's thousands of people all over Norman on game days. I think what Brent mentioned about wanting that game day atmosphere at full go throughout the entire day had a lot to do with guys like Daniel Akinkumi, right, who are – literally seeing what college football is like for the first time. Mm. And I think that what Oklahoma was able to put together left a lasting impression on this guy. I I will say that for Danny Okoye, backtracking real quick, I haven't put a crystal ball in out of respect to a few sources, but my crystal ball would be in on Danny Okoye. Josh, I'm probably going to put in a crystal ball pick for Daniel by the time we're done recording here. I think Oklahoma is the heavy favorite here. It's still being worked through whether or not he's going to take certain other visits now. Yeah. Because I think the Sooners were able to do that much in terms of of impressing this guy. I mean, look, like he had, what, Wagyu beef for the first time in his life after <laughs> his first college football game. I mean, that's it's a pretty good way to start things off. Yeah. Right? So – yeah, OU's in a really good spot here with Daniel. And this is it. And speaking again, too, to who they're recruiting, right, Josh? I mean, he's six foot five, above 300 pounds. And I believe he's ran a 49540 officially overseas. So this dude is a freak of nature with a big frame, someone who you feel like Bill Beanbow could just bring in as a ball of clay and mold into an, just an athletic, physical, raw, power five offensive lineman. And that's why Daniel Akinkumi is a very realistic addition for Oklahoma later down the line. I think there's rumors of him making an official decision sometime in October, but I don't know if anything's set. I have to ask Daniel what his plans are. And overall, though, whatever that may be as far as his plans, I think Oklahoma's a big part of it. And oh, you will continue to recruit this guy no matter what other trips he goes on. And honestly, man, like I mentioned, I, I'm going to put my crystal ball in for a reason. I think this guy could very realistically end up in OU's 2024 class. Still batting a thousand, right? Crystal ball since Sooners yep. Illustrated. Haven't missed, but I don't have any wood to knock it on around me. So <laughs> you, you may have to me, Josh, but it will see. <laughs> 
gonna be like uh don't roger maris hair falling out he's chasing the babe gotta keep the streak keep the streak alive um so yeah i mean it was a lot of guys in town and we'll get more into it as we go along but those are a couple of that um calm felt good about for oklahoma and we'll uh, continue to monitor like i said it was just about it was a lot of guys uh, there over the weekend and more to come obviously as the season progresses so you talk about you want to put a crystal ball in for akukun me you do already have one in for Nigel Smith, who is going to commit on Friday night before his game uh, down south. Um, 7.25, I think, was the approximate start there time at Melissa. Nigel Smith, we've talked about him before. Um, this is a guy who's really, really talented. You've been on him for a while. Your crystal ball has been in for a while. Just, I, I assume things still feel good, but, you know, a little, you know, 36 hours, not quite that much, 30 hours or so away from his commitment. I still feel pretty good here uh, for Oklahoma. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think I look at Nigel, right? And it's no secret. I felt that Oklahoma is the leader for him for a while. Texas A&M was seen as honestly the primary challenger down the stretch. Now, I, I could still see a scenario, obviously, because it's recruiting where maybe there's some Aggie steam that leaks out or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. But I mean, look, man, we're recording on this Thursday. He's recorded or he's going to commit tomorrow night. I'm going to be out there. I've heard that a lot of Oklahoma coaches are going out there for the, the game. And I don't believe that they would go out there without knowing at least something. You know what I mean? So sure. I, I think that OU's in a really favorable position here. But the bottom line, and kind of going macro here, since we kind of know where things stand or we anticipate where this decision might go. On a 40,000-foot level, you know, Nigel Smith, to me, is the guy that has long been a target but has very rarely been talked about. I mean, it's David Stone. You got Williams Winery, Dominic McKinley, Joseph Jonah Ajonye, so on. And so, like, so many dudes mm -hmm. have been rotating through the headlines for you in defensive line recruiting. And Nigel's just kind of there. I mean, I, you know, he's – and he's an awesome guy, too. I really like talking to Nigel. He's a very insightful individual. He's very smart, really sharp guy. He's an analytical type of individual. And I don't know if that's what kind of makes him fly under the radar a little bit. But, man, that, there would be times where I'm covering the Stone or McKinley or Winery recruitments. So I'm like, man, like, Nigel Smith's committing in, what, a month? And now here we are. Uh, he's yeah. going to finally make a decision. And I, and I really do believe that this is a player who, if we're being honest, Josh, like this is the kind of guy you really need if you're going to go to the SEC. I mean, Nigel's going to come in. He's going to play some end. He can kick inside as an interior tech on passing downs. He's violent with his hands. He's aggressive. He's really built well. I mean, what, 6'4", six, 6'5", six, already about 265 pounds, might be up to 270 playing weight. Who knows? I mean, it. It's a really good player, and he's the kind of mold you want on your defensive line going into the Southeastern Conference. And so, man, this decision tomorrow, it is a big one. It may not be as much in the spotlight as maybe the McKinleys or the sure. Stones of the world, but Nigel Smith would be a huge get, and I think in the end the Sooners will be able to get him. Yeah, it's crazy. It kind of shows how much time is flying because it felt like we were talking about his commitment date of September 8th. Um, and that was like so far away. It was like, yeah. so great, man, that's, that's ways out there. And uh, we're here uh, tomorrow. So look forward to that. Austin Colin, like he said, is going to be there. So keep up with Oklahoma at 247sports.com. He's going to be all over it. Um, and you'll find out whenever he makes that decision, puts the hat on, whatever he does on Friday night before their game. Not doing the halftime thing like David Stone. He's going to just go before the game and ride it right into, right into kickoff. Um, I imagine that's a little bit easier for – for you and everybody to kind yeah. of, yeah. I would very much appreciate that. <laughs> so, now, and, and there's rumors too. He's going to like run the commit video on the new stadium scoreboard, which man, nice. if you haven't seen Melissa's brand new stadium, like take some time to Google it after the show. Of course, this, <laughs> this stadium is nuts. And so it's going to be really cool to be out there and see him make the uh, decision before kick potentially on the video board. And then obviously play a game against, Roy City. And hey, if you're going out there, if you're an OU fan, yeah, you can watch Nigel, but make sure you keep an eye on Owen Hollenbeck too. 
So 2025 offensive line target for Oklahoma. He's a really good football player. It'll be a good event to be at if you're an OU fan. 100%. 100%. So, yeah, Friday night, Nigel Smith making his call. Keep up with us and uh, find out what he decides when he decides it officially. All right. Looking at SMU this weekend, before on your way out here, Colin, want to get your thoughts on the ball game. Obviously, Oklahoma and SMU Friday uh, or Saturday night, excuse me, 5 o'clock kick down here in Norman. Uh, obviously, SMU has got uh, a lot of guys with Texas ties. So I got to imagine you got a pretty good feel uh, on this roster, maybe as well as anybody Oklahoma will play. Um, of course, Jordan Hudson, a name that OU fans are very familiar with, former OU commit, decommitted TCU, and as at SMU. I guess thoughts on this game for you. Um, how much of a threat does SMU pose to Oklahoma this weekend? Because I think everybody's trying to figure out basically what Oklahoma did to Arkansas State is, you know, how much stock should we put into Oklahoma being better? And how much stock should we put into Arkansas State being not very good? But we're going to get a better idea this weekend because SMU's got guys, right? I mean, this is going to be an interesting mm-hmm. matchup. I think this is a game where we're going to learn a lot about OU. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're what, two weeks in – Teams are still kind of benefiting from that shroud of uncertainty, right, where we're trying to learn more about what do you want to do? What are you trying to accomplish? How does your new personnel impact your system type of thing? And and I think in SMU, this is a team headlined, obviously, by Rhett Lashley, who's been a longtime offensive coordinator type in the college ranks, has mm-hmm. been a part of some really special squads. I mean, he is a offensive genius, kind of comes from that like Gus Malzahn almost tree where you'll see that type of system ran. So there's going to be a lot of multi-layer play calls. You're, you're going to have guys isolated, movement. I mean, it's, it's going to be a lot going on. And I think for Oklahoma going into this thing, I don't want to dive too much further into details. Obviously, you and Tom and James are going to break this whole thing down, do a great job, all that stuff. For me, though, I, I thought the unique angle, angle I can bring to the table, man, obviously you've got like the old school recruiting battles between these two from Savion Bird to Jordan yeah. Hudson. I mean, it's it's kind of interesting to think back. But for me, you know, I was out at Texas High School Coaching Association's coaching school over the summer which is an opportunity for college coaches and high school coaches to all come to one place and just talk ball. And Rhett actually gave a lecture on his offensive philosophy and adjustments. And I can't go into basically what I saw or whatever, but I'll just say this, man. Like, I think if anything, we're going to learn what OU's defense is actually made of. And on top of that, I think the second half, is the period of play in which I'm really going to be keying in on, Josh, because Rhett is notoriously known for being very good about second-half adjustments, third- and fourth-quarter play calls, trying to throw a little bit of a wrench in the works Mm -hmm. or make you think about what you just thought, right? And so I think, obviously, I look at the defense and I say, we don't really know a ton about this group as it stands. But I don't have a lot of concerns either. I think that at some point we should see some concerns about OU's defense, (laughs) which is very interesting to think about. Now, if there are any concerns, that to me is really going to be a talking point for us over the next week or so. Because if you can go through this SMU game basically unscathed, because, I mean, you got press and stone, you got a deep receiving room. SMU's offensive line isn't the greatest, but, I mean, again, we have to see OU's defensive front right. rush the Packer for a full four quarters. If you get out of this game and Rhett Lashley doesn't burn you a couple times, that will tell me a lot about the position unit that we really need to know more about. We're like, we, at some point, we got to figure out if this defense is for real. And in my opinion, knowing who Rhett Lashley is and what he likes to do, we have to come out of this game and say, this OU defense is either legit or, man, we actually have some reasons to be worried about right. saving that. So. You got a, uh, a final score for us? Scoring a pick? All I got right, the line. Go. The, the, this line's been moving around all over the place. I got – right now I got Oklahoma by 15 and a half is what I see right now on the Caesar Sportsbook. So, it's been kind of moving. I've seen as much as 18. I've seen as low as 14. So, it's kind of been – zigzagging 
It did, didn't it open at 17 and drop to 14, or did it open at 14 and go up to 17? I think it opened at 14 and went up to 17. The public loves – people have fallen a lot. I mean, nationally, the 73 nothing has got people's attention. I mean, yeah, and so Vegas was like, oh, we probably need to up these numbers, but – I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with a cover here. If you're giving me 15 and a half, I'm gonna go like 38-21 advantage Oklahoma. I think SMU musters up some points, whether that be touchdowns, maybe a couple touchdowns and some field goals. Right? Like I feel like yeah. SMU is going to be able to put together some scoring drives, whether that be in the first half or the second. Right? Where I feel like Rhett Lashley finds a lot of success. But in the end, I think Oklahoma wins. I think they cover, and I think they roll into that Tulsa game, which will be a sellout with a 2-0 start. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to it uh, on Saturday night. Going to be a fun one. Um, just nice to see a little step up in competition. We talked about it real briefly on Monday, but, I mean, SMU is better than some of the Big 12 teams that Oklahoma will play later. So this is a, it's a fun little game here this weekend, under the rated, uh, under the radar a little bit nationally because this, uh, this weekend's slate is pretty loaded. So I think mm-hmm. this game's a little bit. It's on ESPN Plus. Nobody's really talking about it. And uh, Oklahoma would like to keep it that way with a nice, comfortable win. Uh, Colin, appreciate you, sir. We'll catch up with you again next week, talk about all the latest. Obviously, Nigel Smith makes a decision on Friday night. We'll be sure to keep up with you as you head out there. And uh, we'll look ahead to the Tulsa game next week as well. Appreciate you, sir. Can't wait. Always want to talk some football. Absolutely. All right, we'll get Tom and James in here. We'll do our full game preview, Oklahoma SMU Week 2 right now. All right, we now bring in Tom Green, James Jackson. Previewed this game a little bit, Week 2, Oklahoma versus SMU. Gentlemen, are you ready for Week 2? Born ready. (laughs) Born ready for Week (laughs) 2? Yeah. Born ready for every week. Yeah, there we go. Stay ready so you don't have to get ready. All right, all right. Should be a fun one this weekend. Oklahoma, SMU, uh, 5 o'clock kick, uh, kick on Saturday. It's an East Bend Plus joint. So, again, like I said on Monday, get your ducks in a row uh, in regards to the uh, the broadcast. That's why the kickoff time is so weird. We're talking about that, Tom and I, before we start recording. These East Bend Plus games are not beholden to a time slot. So, it's kind of – OU kind of just says when they kind of want the game to be, and they went with 5 o'clock. Is it a night game? Is it afternoon? I don't know what to call it. But it's 5 o'clock kick. It is the Stripe the Stadium game, which is uh, pretty fun. First time for Tom getting to experience that. It kind of adds a little extra dynamic. And SMU is not a bad team uh, by any means either. Should be a fun little matchup and a fun little test here for Oklahoma. This is the eighth all-time matchup between the two teams. Oklahoma leads the all-time series 5-1-1 one, one per OU. They led me astray last week with uh, Arkansas State <laughs> Series history. I'm trusting this time. I didn't double-check it. This is from OU. Uh, their official game notes. But it should be an interesting matchup here. SMU also 1-0. They rolled over Louisiana Tech last weekend. Now, guys, I guess just some before we get to the, you know, we'll get into more into the weeds of the matchup and strengths and weaknesses and things like that, obviously. But just general thoughts on this game in terms of, I mean, we talked about a little bit on Monday. This is a step up in competition. I mean, the spread's only 15 and a half at my last check as we start to record. This is not by any means a game that's a gimme for Oklahoma. SMU is a solid team, and Oklahoma should win, obviously. But this is not a gimme either. This can, we're going to learn a lot more about Oklahoma on Saturday. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I mean, this, this is definitely a step up in competition, especially bigger test for Oklahoma's defense more than anything. Um, you know, Rhett, Rhett Lashley yeah. comes from that Gus Malzahn coaching tree. Um, you know, runs a high tempo offense. He's been doing this for a decade now um and yeah it's it's just going to be a a stiffer competition for oklahoma's defense i mean they're going to have their hands full trying to slow things down trying to limit some of those explosive plays and again just trying to build on that pass rush that they you know Mm -hmm. didn't get much of last week just by nature of what arkansas state was doing so really curious to see just how how they kind of adjust to that and adapt to a a more high-powered offense this week yeah, definitely. That's that's the biggest key in this game. I mean, SMU is a – they. we're looking at the highlights from the last game with them with Louisiana Tech. I mean, they're a very explosive offense. They're, they're, they have the capability of having all those explosive plays, and th- that's not that's not the case for Arkansas State. They didn't have that ability at all, so that's why they were bringing back, you know, six or seven guys to block and, you know, getting the ball out quick. SMU, I think, will 
try to be more traditional about their offense in this one, and, and that, that that'll be a problem. So we'll see. We'll really get to see where the OU defense is, I think, in terms of how how well yeah. they are off based on last year in this game because SMU is pretty good. I mean, as we said, their offense is pretty good. I mean, Coach Bert Venables hasn't, you know, he's not taking this for granted or anything like that. He, he seems like he respects them a lot. If Levy said the same thing, I mean, it's a it's a team they really respect, so they're they're taking it serious, and that shows you what kind of team SMU is, especially offensively, which is. I mean, what you usually used to worry about as a Sooner fan, um, teams that come in with higher-powered offenses, how would the defense hold up? So that'll right. be the biggest key for this game so far. Yeah, you know, Rhett Lashley's obviously an offensive head coach. Um, and, you know, like like you guys are saying, I mean, it's a big step up, in especially the skill positions. I mean, Arkansas State just didn't have guys that could, could get loose. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I guess Oklahoma, I mean, we saw – they would test Woody Washington ever. He was just all over guys. And not to say that he couldn't do that again this weekend, but it will be tougher. Um, LJ Johnson, running back for SMU, had a really big uh, week one outing against Louisiana Tech. They got a couple of wide receivers that had nice games. Jordan Hudson, of course, who I talked about a little bit with Colin, is a former OU commit. So OU fans are probably at least vaguely familiar with him. RJ Maryland had a nice game as well. Preston Stone, the quarterback there. Offensive line's a little unproven, but, I mean, you guys are right. This is a... The defense totally dominated Arkansas State, but almost they almost dominated them so much that it was – you almost don't know what to put stock in because it was so dominant in a weird way. It was so overwhelming that, okay, now let's see a little more of a test and see if they can continue to look the part. And if you go dominate SMU – and like I said on Monday, nobody's expecting them to do – shut them out, you know, like they did against Arkansas State. But if you can look like you're in control and not giving up big plays, you're not having coverage buffs. I think Oklahoma fans can start to be excited and optimistic about this offense because or about this defense, I should say, because SMU offensively, they they got some guys. And we'll see. I mean, we'll see what the pass rush really is in this one. I mean, yeah, you, you look at yeah. that's one of the, the the key takeaways we had, I guess, to knock on the defense was that there wasn't a lot of sacks or anything like that. But this would be the big this would be the big test for them. You know get to be uh, up front. I mean, one or two guys you're facing now instead of, you know, three three guys trying to go through the line of scrimmage. So that's what it'll be. And then we talked about this with Woody Washington. SMU has some very tall and lanky uh, wide receivers. So mm-hmm. that'll be a big key. I mean, you talked about the coverage, but there was, I think, one or two in Arkansas State. I think one of them was dropped by the receiver. But you, you don't want to see that happen in this game because these these receivers are a lot more talented. And can really make a, a big play. I mean, like like we said, they can make a big play. So that's that's what you want to see, man. You want to see OU go after that and and be solid all around. I mean, obviously we're not expecting a shutout, but I mean it's good that last game it was the second and third strings that helped hold that shutout through the second half. So they seem pretty pretty you know have a lot of depth. So that that's that's good for OU. Yeah, I want to go back to that pass rush because I mean we talked about it. Uh, Arkansas State a lot of quick three step drops. I think like. 13 of their 27 or so pass attempts were within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage, including like five screen passes behind the line of scrimmage. Um, There's analytical Tom right there. That's that's <laughs> what I'm talking about. That's what I like. He brings that to us. <laughs> yeah, no, they, 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 they were keeping seven and eight guys back in max protect for most of the game, and Oklahoma kind of expected that. But they're going to have a little bit of a tougher test this week against an SMU offensive line that, you know, their starting five has played 139 games combined. Yeah, including damn. 96 starts now. So, I mean, that that is experience up front. Mm-hmm. These guys, you know, as Brent Venable said, you know, Oklahoma is not going to sneak up on anybody uh, this week. You know, SMU knows what to expect. Those guys have seen a lot. So I just want to see how they kind of respond and adjust in terms of that pass rush because they're going to have to win some more one-on-ones than they did last week because most of those guys were getting double teamed up front. Um, so who's going to be that guy that steps up? Obviously, we saw Ethan Downs get that lone sack. Um, you know, I think Rondell Bothroyd had some good moments too. Uh, Jonah uh, Laulu uh, seemed really effective, uh, just getting some pressure up the middle, which is, mm-hmm. I mean, that's why they moved him from defensive end to defensive tackle to begin with, because they want more pressure from those defensive tackle spots. So I want to see who steps up and who can win some of those one on ones this week. Because be you know, last week, Preston Stone just wasn't really pressured. I mean, it was Louisiana Tech, not the toughest competition for SMU either. But I think he had like 33, 34 dropbacks and was only pressured four times total, was hit just once, wasn't sacked. So th- this is an SMU offensive line that, you know, is feeling pretty good coming off of their opener as well. 
offensively in this game uh, for Oklahoma, obviously they, they did whatever they wanted. They guess Arkansas State, same thing. Uh, everything you said about defense goes for offense too. It, they, it was easy um, right down the field, um, scoring just at <clears throat> will. And SMU, the book, I mean – the Mustangs weren't billed coming into the year as being a team that's going to have a great defense. It was kind of they're going to score, and can they just outscore people? Now, they played pretty well against Louisiana Tech, especially against the run. Uh, Louisiana Tech couldn't run the ball at all. Um, mm. They had – let me make sure I got it right – 1.2 yards per carry. That's not yeah. good at all. That's awful. So, SMU defensively uh, – now, they gave us some pass yards, though. They got cut up a little bit in the passing game. Uh, Hank Bachmeyer, the quarterback there, used to be at Boise State, had a decent line, did throw an interception, but a decent line overall. It's one game, so you don't want to put too much into it. But it's going to be interesting to see how Oklahoma goes about this offensively because obviously they didn't run the ball, not poorly, but nothing spectacular. Nobody hit 50 yards individually uh, in the run game last weekend. You should be getting Gavin Sawchuck back. What are we thinking offensively for Oklahoma in this game? I mean, you're hoping for another pretty – Hefty point total, I think. But, you know, I, maybe that's not as much of a pushover defensively as maybe we thought. Again, one game, but I don't know. I guess we'll, we'll have to see how it shakes out. Yeah, like you said, I mean, if they if OU can run the ball, I mean, that'll that'll be great for, you know, both sides of it. Because OU's like, can, it can prove that they can run the ball and, and better than it did last week. And then it also can prove that they run a ball against a good defensive line. Like you said, I mean, 1.2 yards to carry last week. That's that's pretty good. That's pretty good run defense. So if all you can break that, that that'll yeah. be a that'll be the sight to see. I think. Yeah, I mean, last week, I mean, what are what are two of the words that we've heard from Brent Venables and Jeff Levy more than anything else? You know, besides competitive depth, it's situational football and complementary football. I think in week one we saw them play very well situationally, especially on third downs, going eleven of thirteen. Uh, really efficient in that area. This week, I want to see them do play more complimentary football. You know, the passing game was lights out. Rushing game, I mean, they still rushed for 240 yards. Right, it was, yeah, right. Exactly. But yeah. they didn't have any of those explosive running plays. Yeah. Nobody really, you know, broke anything off. Um, it, it was just a little kind of, you know, four yards in a cloud of dust. You know, they, they, they were getting their yardage, but they weren't really, you know, making big things happen in the running game. And I'd like to see some development on that front. Um, I think last week, you know, none of us were surprised that Javante Barnes, you know, finished as the team's leading rusher. But I personally, I, I was surprised that he wasn't more efficient with some of his runs. Um, I think Tommy Walker looked, you know, looked kind of overall better when he got the ball in those runs. So yeah, yeah that was... Tommy Walker looked really tough. Yeah. Uh, you know, Marcus Major and Javante Barnes both did really well in pass protection. Um, Marcus Major got the start. Tommy Walker had a couple touchdowns. You know, it was that by committee approach that we kind of expected to see early in the year. But I, I want I want to see someone break off some explosive plays. I want to see some 10, 15, 20 yard runs. I want to see them kind of capitalize off that and get the offense going that way. Um, because we, we know what this passing game can do. We saw Dylan Gabriel just slice up Arkansas State's defense. I'm sure there's going to be a little bit more resistance this week. But, I mean, this offense is not going to be short on explosive passing plays, I don't think. Mm -hmm. But just getting some more from your running backs, getting those guys going, I think, you know, getting Gavin Sawchuck back will certainly help with that. But I, I just want to see more complimentary football from that from that aspect. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I was going to bring up Gavin Sawchuck will be back this week, too. So we can kind of see what kind of, you know, workload he has in, in his first start this year. Well, not start, but first action out there this yeah. year. And see where he's at. So, I mean, that could that could change things for a lot of the running backs. I mean, it could, it could help out a lot. You know, you got four guys going at it, uh, you know, running the ball and give you less more more rest. You know, more more breaks in between, and maybe somebody can pop off a big run there. Yeah, I mentioned it. You know, I, I had a VIP piece of content yesterday. Of guys I'm watching this weekend, and Gavin Sawchuk was one of them. Not so much as for this matchup, but for for down the road. You know, I mean, you know how many carries Gavin Sawchuk has in his career? Seventeen. 17 mm -hmm. carries is all he has. I mean, he barely played last year. He, until the cheese it Bowl, he essentially never saw the field. So mm -hmm. that's the only game he's really played, like really played, was the cheese it Bowl last year. Now, Gavin Sochuk's a freak. I think we all know that. He's really, really talented. There's no worry there. But you also – let's get the guy some some reps. Just get the guy some carries. So if he is healthy, and it sounds like he is, by all indications he's going to be you know good to go, I'd like to see Oklahoma get, get him – some touch. I'd like to see you know 10, 10 plus carries for him. And I know that's hard because you got Todd Weed, you got Marcus, you got Barnes, but you know, Sawchuck's one of your guys, your guy guys. So 
I like to see him get some carries, get some action uh, this weekend, um, just to break him in a little more. Guys barely played college football. Is there a matchup here that you guys are watching in particular, uh, whether that be you know SMU's receivers versus the secondary, LJ Johnson against that front seven, or offensively, you know Dylan Gabriel going against SMU secondary that you know was a little hit or miss last weekend against Hank Bachmeyer. Is there one in particular that is going to have your eye in this game? Well, I think for me, it's it's that front seven just generating a pass rush against what is a very veteran SMU mm-hmm. offensive line. But beyond that, I mean, we, we saw what LJ Johnson did in, in week one. I mean, he he had, what, like 160 rushing yards, something like that. That's going to be a bigger test for Oklahoma's defensive front. And, 128. Know, yeah, 128. There we go. Yeah. Uh, you know, they were not exactly great against the run last season. Um, and this will be kind of their first real test to see just, you know, how much more push they can get up front um, and, you know, just kind of fortify that line of scrimmage and try to bottle up a talented running back who, you know, he came over from Texas A&M. They also got Jalen Knighton who came over from Miami. Like there's talent in that backfield. Mm-hmm. Like Rhett Lashley did a really good job of plucking some guys from the portal. Um, obviously, you know, he, he knew Knighton from when he was the offensive coordinator at Miami, uh, getting Johnson from Texas A&M. It, it, that's an SEC guy. Um, so it's a talented backfield that I think is going to, you know, really present – Oklahoma's defensive front with its first, you know, major test of this season. And and you said it. I mean, that's that's why it's it's a big game for them. Like we talked about, you know, you know, you only gets one and one and one and two guys now on that offensive line. So that's the biggest key, I think. You know, going going with that and that defensive line. I mean, but also, I mean, you look at the the cornerbacks going against this wide receiver group. I mean, it was a bunch of it was like Preston Stone spread it out to his receivers. There wasn't just like one crazy workhorse on the work on the on the wide receiver unit. It was a bunch of different guys that got looks. So the defensive backs and cornerbacks of four OU, this will be a pretty fun matchup. Woody Washington already gave, you know, what he's trying to do against them. You know, put his hands on them. That's what he wants to do and slow them down. And yeah. and when you put your hands on them, you're you're hoping for your defensive line to put some pressure on the quarterback. So it kind of goes hand in hand in this one. So it, it, I don't I'm not entirely sure if a certain matchup I'm looking for, but I know that the defensive line is a big key to this game this time around. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I know Oklahoma's defensive backs are kind of eager to be tested a little bit more because, um, again, Arkansas State, three-step drops, quick passes to the outside, a lot yes. of stuff you know, within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. So you know, th- th- those guys are eager to kind of you know, see, see some more balls thrown their way, um, get some more opportunities to make some plays, create some turnovers, get some pass breakups, make some big hits like a Reggie Pearson or a Gentry Williams did. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're kind of licking their chops, it seems, with a bigger test up ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that receivers cornerbacks matchup, it's got my eye. Um, you know, whether, especially, you know, Woody and Gentry, I mean, those guys, you know, Arkansas State, they, they weren't tested, like Tom was just saying. Um, so I'm interested to see, you know, Jordan Hudson, 67-yard touchdown. Um, Keyshawn Smith broke a 43-yarder. R.J. Maryland had five catches of 58 yards. So SMU's got several guys who had good week, good games a week ago. And so can they blanket all those guys? They got some speed. You know, they got some talent. These are guys who come from other big programs, like Tom said. Like we referenced on Monday, SMU a big beneficiary of the transfer portal because all these guys who are from that Dallas area, they go somewhere like Miami, like A&M, like whatever, and they leave. They, they say, let me go back to the home, my home soil, and they go back to SMU. And so they've got a lot of talented guys here. And so I'm excited to see, especially in particular, that cornerbacks, wide receivers, man-on-man, can Oklahoma hold up and look as good as they did last week? Mm-hmm. I'll say again, that's a high bar because they just completely overwhelmed Arkansas State. But still, it's going to be – we're gonna like I said, what we said a few times, we're going to learn a lot more about Oklahoma as a team, but especially defensively in this game because this is an SMU team that actually does have some firepower and can score some points. So it's going to be fun to watch. Um, you guys have a pick, picking a score. Um, last week we all obviously had Oklahoma big, but Tom 0-1 against the spread. So you have some redemption uh, here. You didn't have Oklahoma covering last week, and they covered twice over. So uh, like I said, 15 and a half is where I've got That's it right 0-2 then. That's 0-2 then. <laughs> well, he picked all you straight up. Yeah, he lost. He lost twice against the spread. He oh, I see. The spread. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're all one and up straight up. But Tom's all one against the spread. Go for it, Tom. You got to redeem yourself. I'm letting you go first because you have to redeem yourself from last week. Letting me go first. You're making me go first again. <laughs> um, <laughs> You're I'll, last. I'll, 
Yo, I'll go. I'll go first, Tom. If you want me to, you know, uh, I'm I'm okay. I'm all right, all right. Yeah, I, I'll, I'm going to take OU to cover. I, I think it's going to be. I was going back and forth between 45-17 or 45-23. Um, I think I'll go 17 though. 45-17 sounds about right. Beat down. You got a healthy, healthy OU win. Yeah, I'm, I'm picking them as well. I, I think what is the spread is like two two touchdowns or something like that. Uh, Fifteen and a half. Yeah, so I'll go three touchdowns. I think uh, if I do my math right, but well, forget forget I said it. I'm gonna go forty two to to fourteen. I think that's the uh, that's the final score here. Forty two fourteen. Wow. Yep. So you guys are both having Oklahoma winning really big uh, in, in this one. I got I got forty one seventeen. Um, I think Oklahoma's gonna win pretty good. I mean, I I do mostly agree. I mean, I. I don't know. I mean, it's so hard to tell after last week um, what to what to make of OU right now. I mean, they've kind of become a little bit of a you know national. I mean, you guys have seen like FPI. I mean, they're they're through the roof on all those things after what they did last weekend. All of a sudden, I think ESPN's playoff predictors got OU as like the fourth highest odds to make the playoff. Like just after one week, the, the, the narrative has changed a lot. So. We'll see. Uh, but I got 41-17. Colin had 38-21, so he had a much closer game. Mm, but okay. we do all have Oklahoma covering the number of 15 and I, I like that score. 38-21 is a pretty respectable score for, for both sides. I mean, it's – yeah. I mean, <laughs> really game. I'm going to stay where I'm at, though. Yeah. I, jo- I think- Josh gives me a hard time saying I'm picking a big beat down. His is like a, a field goal difference. <laughs> I wasn't disagreeing. I was just surprised you got. I thought I was going to be the, 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 big, the big guy here. So Colin at 38-21. James, you had – I'm trying to write these down. Give me your scores again. 42-14, I think this is. 42-14, okay. Yeah. So James picked the same spread as me, too. <laughs> and Tom, you had – Hey, I didn't give you any, fl- any, any flag. That's, 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 that's all I Josh, wasn't right? giving flack. I was just making a comment. <laughs> yeah. But I have 45-17. So. All right, yeah. Then I got I got 40. James, James, you're, you're doing, James, Tom, you're James, doing too James, much James with the field goal. James does not believe in field goals. You're doing too much with the field goal, Tom. That's what it is. That's, that's what's messing Josh up there. <laughs> So we all got Oklahoma covering, and it uh, should be a fun game on, on Saturday night. Looking forward to it. 5 o'clock kick, um, and we're all going to be there. We're all going to be on site uh, once again. Obviously, keep up with us all throughout the day for game day coverage. And then after the game, obviously, James and I will hit a recap on the field. Hopefully, people found that and enjoyed that uh, on Saturday. We're going to try and shift the schedule around a little bit so we can get that out quicker because we're going to one of the first things we do uh, after the game. So look mm-hmm. for that a little quicker after the game this time, Saturday night before you go to bed. Um, because this is going to be a little bit of a late night for us with that uh, 5 o'clock start. Looking forward to this game, though, uh, guys. It's going to be a fun one. Any last thoughts on this game before we uh, sign off and head into our uh, week two weekend? I like I like my spread because of what OU did last week. I, I, I've seen that they won't just give up, you know, late touchdowns just because now. I mean, they, they have the pride to not do that. So that's the reason I'm going with 14 for, for, for SMU. I, like, I know this offense is high-powered. You know, and you, you look at what they did last week, 38 points to now 14. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I just – I believe in what OU has done. And they, they still have everybody relatively healthy on the d- defensive side. Uh, the, the key guys that you need, you know, like the defensive line and the, and the cornerbacks. And so I think that's a good explanation for why I think it will be 14. But, you know, it's it's all right to be wrong sometimes. And, you know, so I'll, I'll see if, if I'm wrong. Hey, I'll, I'll take that just like Tom did. James, this James is bracing for, for and, his uh, L. Yeah, I'm gonna be like you, man. I'm just gonna take that L. <laughs> but no, I I think OU will win, you know, convincingly in this game, regardless of what what happens. It won't be a it won't be a shootout like I think we've seen over the last couple of years. I think it'll be a pretty, you know, pretty good win for OU if they do it. Yeah, I think my kind of closing thought on this is 5 p.m. kickoff. Ready to see a little bit better game day atmosphere. Um, fans will have a little bit more opportunity to you know tailgate before the game. I know there's mm-hmm. only what one family on Lindsay Street last week. I think that'll change with a with a later kickoff, some more time mm-hmm. for people to relax, hang out, get ready for a game, and it not be so hot. It won't. Yeah, it won't be hot. It won't be hot this time. So we, we might people oh, might stay the hot. entire time. It'll be hot. It won't be, it won't be as hot though. I mean, like we, I it, may, know, it may start. The heat of the day. It may start hot. Yeah, what, 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 weather's cool been cooler day. this week. Yeah, it won't. It won't uh, start cool and that. get hotter. I don't know about all that. Let's check. Let's check at the J- game. James time. and I say that from the comfort of an air conditioned press box while Josh is down on the field. Check, check the weather. Check the, the weather. Temperature's thirty degrees higher, but I mean the high in Norman today is one hundred and one. What is no? What is it? What is it on Saturday? What are we? Ninety three. Five o'clock. No, yeah, I mean, hey, it's not bad. So it'll be like ninety three, but you have to like also add ten degrees in the stadium because it's just way hotter in the stadium. Yeah, it's gonna be toasty, but it'll be the second half. It'll be pleasant, and uh, they'll do the light show. I'm sure, and it'll be a whole thing. Try at the stadium. 
I kind of want to see what, what everybody guesses now. What's the temperature going to be? Are we, are we are we checking on the weather app each day? Leave, leave a comment. Let's, let's get your guesses in there. What, Whatever what it is, you got to add like five or ten in the stadium. It plays up in the stadium. It's not turf, thankfully. It's not turf, I'm turf, saying. It's not course. turf, so it's not. Yeah, but it's just know. different. The bowl, it, there's no flow in there. It's all the body heat then, huh? You're saying the body yes. heat accumulates. Yes, precisely. With the concrete. Precisely, <laughs> yes. Uh, ever since they bowled it in, too, there's just way less airflow um, in there. So More yeah. seats, though. More seats. Well, yeah. So. Worth it for OU. Yeah. Uncomfortable for us. Um, <laughs> for us you, field, for us you. field dwellers. <laughs> I was yeah. going to say it. Uh, <laughs> um, all right. I think that's it. Oklahoma SMU, Saturday night, 5 o'clock. Tanner Mordecai Bowl. Too bad he's not still there. I thought it added a little extra wrinkle um, to this uh, this ball game. But should still be a fun one. Preston Stone, fun quarterback for SMU. Excited to see this game. And like we said a bunch of times this week, we're going to learn a lot more about Oklahoma one way or another this weekend. Keep up with us. Oklahoma, not 247sports.com. Tons of coverage on Saturday coming your way. Obviously, lots already there this week and more to come over the next couple of days leading up to the game. But obviously, especially on game day, you're going to want to hang out with us and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Lots of reaction from uh, us, obviously, but then also Venables, players will all live there on Saturday night after the game so keep up with us in any way you can find us on saturday that's it for now james and i will talk to you on saturday night for our instant reaction to oklahoma's matchup with smu until then for colin kenny earlier tom green james jackson i'm josh calloway we'll see you saturday night from the stadium see you